Okay, this is much better. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, to our Global Studies Seminar Series. I'm Luis Villanueva, and I'm the Global Studies, uh, Global Studies Seminar Coordinator for, for this semester. Uh, now let me introduce our speaker for tonight. For those of you who do not have the uh, luxury of knowing, knowing Dr. Cruz, let me share uh, some information about him. Dr. Cruz is a visiting assistant professor in international studies uh, here at Denison. Prior to joining Denison, he taught in the Comparative Religion program at CSU Chico in California uh, and the Global Studies Department at GVSU in Michigan. Uh, his areas of research include social movements, uh, indigenous rights, environmental justice, religious nationalism, and white supremacist politics. He earned his PhD in politics from the New School for Social Research in New York City. Before I leave the floor to Dr. Cruz, let me just share uh, some information about the mechanics for tonight's event. Dr. Cruz will speak for around 30, 35 minutes, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. Uh, we will start first with questions from people here in the auditorium, and then we will move to questions uh, from people on Zoom. If you are uh, joining this event on Zoom, please type your questions on the chat box, and then we will read these uh, questions to, to the speaker for, for, for tonight's talk. Without further words, I will leave the floor to Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you. <clears throat> How's everybody doing this evening? You all doing okay? All right, great. So thank you for coming out on uh, this chilly evening, at least here in Greenville, Ohio. Um, so the title of my talk, as you can see here, COVID Denial, Race, Religion, and Conspiracy Theories. And for those of you that are students in my classes, hopefully you're not sick and tired of hearing about conspiratorial politics in the far right, but we're going to get a little bit more of that this evening. Um, so I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. So I want to acknowledge the traditional and unceded territories of the Shawnee, the Potawatomi, the Delaware, the Miami, the Peoria, the Seneca, the Wyandotte, the Ojibwe, and the Cherokee indigenous nations in what is now the state of Ohio. This land is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work and live on this land. And as many of us know, a land acknowledgement is not enough, but it's an important social justice and decolonial practice. It promotes indigenous visibility and is a reminder that we are on settled indigenous land. So I hope this land acknowledgement can be an opening for us to contemplate ways to support decolonial and indigenous movements for sovereignty and self-determination. So just briefly to give you a sense of what I'm going to be talking about here uh, in the next few minutes or the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes, so how can we think about pandemic politics in a global perspective? How can we think about the specifically sort of religious aspects of this current pandemic? How can we think about conspiratorial politics and the pandemic more broadly? Um, what role do things like white nationalism and far-right extremism play in the current pandemic? And what are some of the potential threats to democracy and some future political trends that uh, these different dynamics that I'm talking about perhaps suggest that we should be paying more attention to. So we're now in the third year of the pandemic, as all of you are aware of, and over six million people have died so far. And life as we know it in sort of the pre-pandemic world is possibly over. We're certainly not sure what it would look like to go back to a pre-pandemic era, and the future itself is very unclear. So my talk tonight will draw on some research that I've been doing into pandemic politics and these sort of three intersecting issues um, over the last year or two, um, in part with my co-editor, Brian Taylor, and we're releasing a special issue of the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture later this spring. I'm looking specifically at these politics of religion and the pandemic. So um, this talk comes from some of the intro that we wrote together trying to make sense of um, these various trends. So. If, these are issues that are of interest to you. Stay tuned for this journal coming out later this spring. Um, so as I said, I'm going to look at these sort of three different dynamics today of race, religion, and conspiracy theories. And I'll try to argue that they've been manifesting in increasingly problematic ways. And 
these are in part a response to these dynamics of the pandemic. And these are questions that I personally find interesting, but a number of scholars, and a growing number of scholars, particularly in the last few years, um, are worried about these trends, particularly in relationship to democratic politics and the future of democratic politics. Um, and this threat to democratic politics is originating both from within democratic countries as well as authoritarian states, but they're driven, I would argue, primarily by growing public support for far-right extremism, and especially in uh, U.S. and European context, white identity politics that are increasingly seeing the world um, in these very racialized and kind of exclusivist um, political imaginaries. So you can see here on the slide, um, in February of 2021, the Pew Research Center asked people what they thought life would be like in the year 2025. And what they found was that the plurality of experts think sweeping societal change will make life worse for most people as greater inequality, rising authoritarianism, and rampant misinformation take hold in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. And similarly, the Global State of Democracy in 2021 report, which was put out by um, IDEA, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, warned that democracies around the world are facing, quote, a perfect storm of threats from both within and from a rising tide of authoritarianism. And for those of you that are um, here in the United States, the January 6th Capitol insurrection is a very clear and obvious example of these trends. But this sort of growing power of right-wing politics is not certainly limited to the United States. We can look to Brazil and Bolsonaro, to Turkey and Erdogan, to India and Modi, to Russia, to Hungary, to Poland, and just a few countries that in recent years have been increasingly shifting to the right. And for those that are following global politics, we might need to add France to that list soon if Marine Le Pen ends up winning the second runoff in the French presidential race soon. In particular, the January 6th insurrection gives us lots of colorful characters for thinking about some of these dynamics. Here, the infamous QAnon shaman, Jake and Jelly, wearing the sort of iconic fur-covered buffalo helmet and the uh, patriotic face paint that symbolizes uh, for many people, this fusion of religious nationalism, conspiratorial politics, and far-right beliefs. I'm speaking from jail, and Jelly is currently in jail for his role in the January 6th insurrection. He told the podcast Conservative Daily that this is spiritual warfare, gentlemen. And the fact of the matter is, we are winning. And he went on to describe his role as a shaman, as one who is, quote, fighting the spiritual war for the people to be the one that shows the people the flaws within its system, within its culture, and helps them to repair those flaws. So I think Angeli's case really provides a clear example of this kind of religious hybridity or fluidity, some might say syncretism, if you're a religious studies scholar. Um, in this case, sort of a mix of New Age and sort of Norse pagan mythology and practices. And it calls our attention to the increasing important role that religion is playing in fostering particularly social unrest and social divisions. Um, if we step back outside of the U.S. specific context in South Korea, the Sinjiangi Church of Jesus, led by Pastor Lee Man Hee, you can see pictured there on the top, um, was blamed for sparking one of the worst outbreaks in South Korea in 2020 of COVID. A uh, similar super spreader event occurred in that same year in France, again linked to a gathering of religious fundamentalist organizations. And in both cases, religious beliefs and actors were blamed for accelerating the pandemic, particularly through these large, unmasked religious gatherings. But also, this sort of combination of an aggressive proselytizing and kind of missionary work led the events and kind of the example of South Korea and many observers watching it to label the Xinjiang Church a dangerous religious cult. And you can see on one of the gatherings there pictured here. But yet, despite this negative attention and the sort of public scandals that were involved um, with the church. The church announced in December of 2021 that they had actually gained nearly 20,000 um, new followers that past year. And in many ways, I think this speaks to the growing power of charismatic and Pentecostal religious movements, which Sinjiunji is kind of part of that broader landscape. And so I think this raises an interesting question for us as scholars. Now, do pandemics increase the number of devotees in some religious groups, and if so, why, and uh, which ones, and how is that happening? Um, 
And also we might think about how do pandemics, particularly this current pandemic, um, erode or deepen um, faith of the followers. So one possible answer, you can see some of the results here from a 2020 Pew Research Center survey on religion in the pandemic that looked at 14 different countries in sort of advanced economies. And what they found was that the most dramatic increase in religion occurred here in the United States with nearly 50% of white evangelicals um, who they had surveyed claiming that their faith had increased. 35% um, for Catholics, 21% for white mainline Protestants, but only 5% for those religiously unaffiliated. But sort of more broadly across all of those 14 countries, they found that 66% of respondents um, believed that religious views had not really changed at all, while 50% 15% sorry, said the religions had strengthened, and 8% said they were on the decline. So what we see is important variations both within religious traditions and across different countries and geographies on, on the sort of question of how religions are responding to the pandemic. Um, in South Asia, South Asia, religious groups and NGOs got together and launched what was called the Awareness with Human Action, or the AHA research project in response to the pandemic. And their goal was to promote awareness of COVID-19 and constructive narratives that reduce discrimination, hate speech, and stigmatization by recruiting religious leaders, women, uh, and youth leaders in community organizations who could influence these discourses. And so looking at and noting these kind of both positive and problematic religious dynamics, researchers at the Religion and Globalization Center at the Asia Research Institute in Singapore launched the Krona Asur website, which you can see pictured here. And this website is dedicated to tracking um, religious responses to the pandemic, and it draws its name from this sort of common Hindu and Buddhist belief in the asuras, or these sort of demonic or spiritual beings who often have malevolent or maybe trickster intentions, and then like to intervene and cause problems in our world. And so the coronavirus is seen as one possible manifestation um, of that kind of idea. And similarly, if you look to the Middle East and North Africa, Specifically here in Mecca and Saudi Arabia, the annual Hajj takes place. We're currently in Ramadan right now, for those of you that are following these practices. Um, we saw a major shutdown of activity, particularly for outsiders coming in for their ceremony. So if you've ever seen pictures of the Hajj in Saudi Arabia, you would know normally there would be a completely packed mass of people around the Kaaba and there the black stone in the center. But here you can see the very small numbers and kind of social distancing practices. So this past year, we saw the reopening of the Hajj to outsiders after having been closed down in the previous years. And in the case of East Africa, some of the Nairobi-based churches, such as the All-African Conference of Churches, has worked on trying to educate people about the risks of misinformation, particularly within sort of evangelical and Pentecostal religious communities. So um, Reverend Simon Beliso Kamalo, who's a religion professor at the University of KwaZulu Natal, Peter Maritzburg, uh, noted, talking about these trends, that pastors in Kenya wrongly believed often that COVID-19 was more than a virus. And that belief led them to tell their followers that because they're members of a Pentecostal church and they're children of God, the virus would not infect them. Or if it did, they would be healed by Jesus, the physician. So this idea of COVID-19 causing an imbalance, whether that's a religious imbalance from sinful behaviors, a lack of proper rituals, um, angry nature spirits, or from secular explanations such as climate change, genetic engineering, and capitalism causing or making pandemics like this more prevalent. Um, what is evident in these different pandemic discourses is this sense that something is out of whack, something is imbalanced. Right? The cause may vary between different believers. So for example, a Hindu leader in India argued that the virus is an avatara descended on Earth to restore the universal balance which had deteriorated because of the increasing number of meat eaters. Conversely, an Islamic State narrative justified the pandemic as divine retribution against China for its treatment of the Uyghur Muslims in the western part of the country. And a Feng Shui master blamed it on the preponderance of metal and water elements over fire in the early year of Iraq. So we see a lot of different ways to try to make sense of what is the cause of imbalance and how do we possibly restore that? But at kind of a larger global level, one of the important trends we've seen in response to these global dynamics within the pandemic is that many religious communities have moved services online, particularly in the early phase of the pandemic when everything was locked down. 
with the exception, of course, of those who thought COVID was either a hoax or perhaps something that God would protect them from and continued on their practices as they had before. Um, but for many people, that move to online uh, was a significant disruption of religious practices. And this move to virtual religious engagement um, has created a whole set of new problems, um, in part because the spread of conspiratorial and anti-vax politics has largely taken place online and through social media. And so if you're locked up at home online more, you have a greater likelihood of being exposed to these ideas, particularly um, as growth and access to the internet through mobile phones becomes more and more prevalent around the world. And then on top of that, those of you that follow these trends, we've seen um, increasingly poor job, although starting to improve, of big tech companies sort of intervening in to manage the sort of circulation and spread of conspiratorial politics, pseudoscience, and anti-vax messaging um, over the past few years. So their networks have been central to spreading these ideas, and more people are online to be exposed to those ideas at the same time. Now, much of this denial, I would argue, can be traced back to kind of the way that religion and politics reinforce each other in problematic ways. Particularly the politics of COVID denial draws on sort of a range of different ideological sources. So for some, the anti-vax and anti-mandate views are rooted in far-right politics and religious beliefs, um, especially those that are more in the sort of QAnon conspiracy theory circles of ideas. Um, but scholars have noted a number of different changes that have been brought on by the pandemic that can prime people to be more likely to accept these conspiratorial beliefs. So for example, in April of 2021, a U.S. public religion survey found that only three in 10 Republicans who trusted far-right news or television um, were vaccine acceptors. And these same individuals they found were more likely to believe QAnon conspiracy theories. Scholars Bailey, Elaine Bond, and Ryan Neville Shepard, who have also been looking at these um, sort of conspiratorial dynamics, have looked at how religion, politics, and conspiracy theories came together in the United States um, in novel ways in the last two years during the pandemic. And they actually argued that in sort of the U.S. political context that Trump's embrace of uh, vaccine skepticism, like sort of QAnon conspiracy theories, and claims about a rigged election formed essentially what they describe as a kind of presidential eschatology for Trump believers. And speaking to these different sort of divisions within religion and political societies, um, journalist Doug Livingston, who is here, um, writes in Ohio News, argued that partisan opinions on vaccine have become measurable proxies for who lives and who dies. And we saw, for those of you that have been following news earlier this year, another version of this playing out in Ottawa and Canada with the so-called truck freedom caravan and protests against mandates in Canada. So for Trump devotees like Angeli, COVID denial is grounded in a commitment to both new age healing and alternative medicine, many of which come out of these conspiratorial circles and which are viewed as avoiding the evils of big pharma. You can see sort of one embodiment of these ideas pictured there. So for example, a cross-national study that focused on science skepticism and vaccine hesitancy found that in the 24 countries that they had surveyed, spirituality and beliefs in alternative medicine played a crucial role in fostering low faith in science and vaccine skepticism. And we've seen similar new age skepticism about mainstream medical science, Evident, for example, in May of 2021 at a series of worldwide freedom rallies held at popular New Age gathering in Glastonbury, England. You can see a poster, a number of the events taking place around the world, not just in England at that time. Describing one of these gatherings in Glastonbury, Jules Evans describes the gathering as follows. The worshippers beat their drums and invoked the spirits in their battle against the evils of modern medicine before proceeding down the main street of Glastonbury like medieval millenarians during the plague. And so you get these really interesting uh, sort of left and right alliances coming together through some of these shared conspiratorial beliefs, um, sort of anti-COVID, anti-vax beliefs, and uh, shared support for alternative health and medical approaches to the pandemic. Um, discussing these trends in the context of Germany, uh, Mira Dietrich, who's a researcher at the Berlin-based CMOS, which is the Disinformation and Conspiracy Research Center, added that there's a certain regressive and unscientific worldview that comes from these various esoteric corners where alternative cures have long been mainstreamed in certain green and kind of left nonconformist circles. And he notes that this trend has been prevalent, particularly among 
uh, middle class people who trust their feelings more than they trust the experts. If we sort of look back to India and parts of South Asia, researchers have identified similar dynamics there, linking beliefs, for example, in Ayurvedic yoga. Uh, many of them connected to this well-known guru, Baba Ramda, you can see pictured here, selling his Corona kits through his Patanjali um, company, and telling people that you can use folk remedies such as turmeric and cow urine and others to cure your COVID infections. And prior research looking at these dynamics has demonstrated strong links between conspiratorial beliefs, conservative religious views, and support for right-wing, especially far-right politics. I mean, in fact, scholar Eric Kurlander has similarly argued that the pseudoscience combined with authoritarianism and belief in the supernatural was actually a key part of Nazi ideology during World War II, and that we're seeing a revival of some of those same ideas today. So among political conservatives, uh, the COVID denial tends to be entangled with fundamentalist and ultra-Orthodox religious beliefs. You can see President Trump with a number of the evangelical and fundamentalist pastors who were supporting him, um, blessing him and giving him the power to rule. So political scientist James Druckmann and his co-authors looking at these dynamics found that more religious individuals hold significantly fewer correct beliefs about not only science, but COVID in particular. And a key finding by sociologist Laura Penix and her co-authors in a similar study found that beliefs in an engaged God were associated with greater mistrust in the COVID-19 vaccine. And similarly, more conservative Jews, Christians, and Muslims have advanced and embraced apocalyptic coronavirus narratives, claiming that the increasing frequency and intensity of fires and floods and plagues of locusts and ideas of divine punishment are evidence of this rapidly approaching apocalypse and the end of the world. And psychiatrist Simon Dean, who's looked at these uh, dynamics, noted, some Christians claim that COVID-19 is proof of the plague of the Book of Revelation, and in particular, the seven seals described in Revelation 6, 1 through 8, 1, which are occurring now, some of them believe, meaning that Jesus' return is imminent. Um, similarly, religion scholar Teres Ostebo and his co-authors looking at these dynamics in um, East Africa described popular Ethiopian religious responses to the April 2020 outbreak of COVID-19 as being an expression of God's wrath and his punishment for sin. And he noted in that study that many Ethiopians believed that uh, divine intervention was necessary in order to prevent the further spread of the virus and to overcome its devastating impacts. So these different kind of forms of religious-based denial are often rooted in beliefs about a personal God, as I noted earlier, who will protect the devout. And as we've seen, however, this is an assertion that led many, particularly uh, conservative pastors who refuse to get vaccinated and continue to hold services, to themselves contract COVID and to die. But in some of these extreme cases, what we see is that anti-vax religious conservatives describe their resistance as a kind of spiritual warfare against a demonic agenda and a corrupt, shattered government that are part of the secret deep state conspiracy. And as religious studies scholar Aaron Rickers noted in talking about these dynamics, for many North Americans with a Christian background, the global COVID conspiracy is literally apocalyptic phenomena. Agreeing to wear a face mask can amount to wearing the mark of the beast from the book of Revelation. The COVID-19 vaccine can contain a microchip branding people with the mark of the beast. And you can see some of those references in the graphics here on the screen. And psychologist Simon Dean has similarly observed that it's religious fundamentalists who generally associate the coronavirus as a sign of the end times or final judgment. But as I noted, apocalypse can be secular as well as religious. So these secular apoc apocalyptic narratives have vary widely from ecological collapse, nuclear threats, the um, long-running AI invasion scenarios. And these secular apocalyptic narratives provide a critique of the philosophy and structure of consumption-based capitalism, he argues, looking at some of these dynamics. But they also call into question old ways of thinking and living by helping to reveal the weaknesses of these structures, which pr prove difficult to see from within. And so this is a common argument we hear from environmentalists that the increasing destruction of rainforests and expanding urban areas is making 
contacts with contagions and forests in areas that we used to have less contact with, more prevalent and more likely. Now, you don't need a conspiracy to make that argument, so you see both of these dynamics playing out in different ways. But what's important is that whether this sort of perspective is seen from a religious or a secular viewpoint, um, there's a, a large amount of agreement that the pandemic has the potential to reveal something important to us. But where the political disagreement is, is exactly what the pandemic is revealing. So I think these examples help illustrate some of the political stakes that follow when a pandemic manifests further pressures and sort of magnifies existing social divides and social conflicts. So for example, those of you who may be familiar with Mark Jurgensmeyer, an important scholar both of religion and global studies, he argues that sort of the increasing combination of politics and religion can heighten existing social conflicts and the mixing of religion with nationalism strengthens ties between some while marginalizing others through legislation and public opinion. And we can certainly see these dynamics at work in 2021 during the nationalist rallies and marches that took place across many countries in Europe, as well as the responses to the pandemic by authoritarian regimes in Turkey, Russia, and China, as well as far-right leaders in Brazil, Hungary, and Poland. In fact, if you sort of were watching these events on the ground at the time, you would have noticed that many of the rallies in Europe that opposed these various pandemic restrictions and um, sort of mandates around vaccines, vaccine passports, particularly in a European context, um, they were also closely linked with policies that were opposing uh, migration from outside of Europe. And so effectively what they did was combine sort of anti-COVID, anti-mandate politics with anti-immigrant anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic discourses that peddled dis sort of discredited conspiracy theories like Arabia, the idea of an Islamic invasion of Europe, or the ideas of white genocide or sort of great replacement because of demographic changes. So when we look at all these different sort of politics, what we see is that the pandemic has also fueled growing anti-democratic religious politics. For example, in context of India with Hindu nationalists, advancing the Hindutva political philosophy and their growing influence under Prime Minister Narendra, Narendra Modi and the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP party that's currently in power. The BJP in India was particularly central in promoting conspiracy theories that linked COVID-19 to Muslims through this coronavirus jihad hashtag on social media and through various pandemic emergency measures that specifically targeted Muslim communities as vectors of spread and put in various sort of restrictions on movement um, or exclusionary policies, specifically under the idea that Muslims themselves were the source of the spreading of these viruses. So for example, a 2020 analysis of the term Krona Jihad on social media in India by the Quality Labs um, think tank found that the hashtag insinuated that Muslims are terrorists, and you can certainly see that in one of these um, tweets up on the screen there that they were intentionally spreading the virus as an act of bioterrorism. Unleashed by Hindu nationalists in India via Twitter, this hashtag is now being used globally on all social media platforms. And we can see another example of sort of the way that religious nationalism has played out in India. So we had a large gathering of Muslims in 2020, the Tadivu Jamaat Conference in India, who faced criminal charges for hosting a, what turned out eventually afterwards to be a COVID-19 super spreader event. Yet, a similar response did not occur when the Hindu Kumela religious festivals took place in early 2021 at Uttarakhand, and you can see those pictured here. The Mela, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a large religious um, gathering, it takes place over a number of months, took place in 2021 and saw an estimated nine million people in attendance with minimal social restrictions. At the height of the Mela, cases jumped to an astounding 18,000% in Uttarakhand, which is one of the states of India, leading the Dean of Brown University School of Public Health, Ashish Jha, to call the event one of the biggest super spreaders in the history of the pandemic. But despite the risks from COVID-19, from massive unmasked gatherings like this, Hindus still chose to participate in this religious rites. In fact, when asked about it later, Uttarakhand Chief Minister Tarath Singh Rawat told reporters that the viral surge uh, from Kumela was not something devout Hindus needed to worry about because, quote, faith in God will overcome the fear of the virus. 
Now, in contrast to that, conservative West Bengal Imam Maulana Barkhadi had a slightly different take on this dynamic in India, and he argued that divine protection from the pandemic in India actually went to Muslims, not to Hindus, suggesting that, quote, corona is a threat to Hindus, not to Muslims. The virus has not affected the Muslim localities. We have such blessings of Allah that we remain unaffected. And so you see different ways that religious groups, even within one country, are trying to make sense of these religious dynamics. Now, in the United States and in Europe, what we've seen coming out of many of these trends, they certainly existed before, but I think they've been magnified through the pandemic, is that religious nationalism and political violence has been increasingly fused with clusters of ideas that scholars in religious studies and some other allied fields are increasingly describing as white Christian nationalism. So for example, religion scholars Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry um, describe this Christian nationalism phenomenon as a cultural schema or a collection of narratives, traditions, myths, values, systems, and symbols which express a belief that America is distinctly Christian and that this should be reflected in public policies, sacred symbols, and national identity. Um, other scholars of religion in particular that have been looking at these dynamics have identified two main ideological commitments among these white Christian nationalists. And the first one being an antipathy, antipathy sort of a hatred or a disgust towards racial and ethno-religious minorities such as blacks, immigrants, and Muslims. And secondarily, the promotion of an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity and American civic life. So the, the idea that America has been, should be, um, and is inherently a Christian nation, and particularly a white Christian nation um, for white nationalists. We see these same kind of arguments echoed, for example, in the work of Anthea Butler and her um, research on white evangelical racism. And we have a growing body of scholarship over the last five or six years that's being sort of developed and expanding that documents these links between um, white supremacist movements, white nationalist movements, conservative Christianity, and religious violence. And unfortunately, these dynamics have all increased during and in response to the pandemic. So this kind of nebulous QAnon movement, groups like the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys, Oath Keepers, some of which existed before the pandemic and some of which emerged um, almost in parallel with the pandemic. Um, we saw them in full force, for example, in the January 6th insurrection here in the United States. Um, but they were evident both before and after in anti-vax politics and kind of various other anti-government, anti-establishment protests. Um, those of you that have been following news in sort of this region may have been watching the trial of the Michigan militia members who were charged with the conspiracy to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer and possibly execute her. Although some of them have been um, found not guilty on the charges on the basis that it was too heavily um, pushed by the FBI, so another interesting example of conspiratorial politics having some element of truth to them, which gives people um, a reason to hang on to some of these conspiracies even harder. They can point to the examples and say, look, this is the deep state government at work. But what we see is that these dynamics left unchecked have the potential for um, much greater levels of violence, even targeting um, major like officials like governors. And unfortunately, these groups are continuing to mobilize support for various far-right political ideas and beliefs today, both online and increasingly offline as sort of the pandemic politics, particularly in the United States, begin to improve somewhat. And expanding their base of support in preparation for what comes next, um, which is both state-level election and the 2024 election in the United States context. So let me wrap up with a few sort of final reflections here. Um, what I've seen happening over the course of the pandemic so far is both the magnification of these various interconnected dynamics of race, religion, and conspiracy theories in ways that are effectively driving deeper wedges um, both within and between societies and groups within individual countries and sort of regions of the world. And this is most evident, I think, in the context of Europe around migration politics right now, but we're certainly also seeing this in the U.S. with um, Latin American migrants. And we can think about these dynamics um, in a few different ways. And so we've seen a surge of attacks on anti-racist anti education and gender-inclusive policies in public schools here in the U.S. 
Um, the new anti-LGBTQ legislation that Florida Governor Rick DeSantis recently signed into law, the Don't Say Gay Bill, is one of those many examples. And we're seeing nationwide efforts to ban the teaching of quote-unquote divisive concepts around race, class, and gender in many states across the country, and that's taking place here in Ohio as well, House Bills 322 and 327, and the recently introduced House Bill 616. We're seeing this in the growing number of hate crimes and anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic violence that has been on the rise and before the pandemic, but seemed to escalate even more during the pandemic. And we're seeing the growing power of far-right and white nationalist political parties to win both local and national elections. And we're seeing it in the rise of these various ethno-nationalist political parties, sort of the BJP-style Hindutva politics in India, kind of white Christian nationalism embodied in movements like the America First. You can see pictured here at the Capitol on January 6th. And kind of more broadly, and particularly in the context of Europe, this sort of growing white hostility to what are perceived as non-European, often non-Christian migrants and refugees. And as I said, we can see this in both the U.S. context with Latin American migrants, as well as in Europe with Middle East and North African migrants. So while I've talked more about the United States in sort of our cultural context tonight, um, I hope I've at least given you some sense that these are global trends and not something specific to just um, North America or even Europe. But I think these dynamics raise two uncomfortable but important questions that we need to be thinking about. First one is, how much longer can democratic politics endure in the face of these rising um, anti-democratic threats and anti-democratic political movements, especially if we look at increasing voter disillusionment with the basic functioning of democratic politics and things like the elections here in the United States. And then secondarily, what do we do when democratic politics increasingly fail to prevent the rise of fascist and authoritarian political leaders and political parties? How do you address that within a democratic framework without resorting to violence. And I think the pandemic has showed us that we need to be thinking much more about those questions and figuring out what are possible answers because these issues are not going away. And as we increasingly see the world become more diverse, more cultural, um, and more integrated, these tensions are only going to continue to grow. So figuring out how we address them becomes perhaps one of the key challenges of democratic theory in the years ahead and certainly a key issue for thinking about global challenges here and abroad. Thank you.